This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by the London College of Garden Design, Melbourne. Based at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Melbourne, the college brings together unique Australian design and horticultural expertise with the training experience of Europe's leading garden design college. The college delivers professional skills training for those aiming for a career in landscape design and from 2021 will offer a real-time online option for those who want to study from anywhere in Australia or New Zealand. To find out more, visit lcgd.com.au. So this week I'm speaking to garden designer and horticulturist Joe McCurr, who runs Pretensis Gardens. Joe is particularly interested in designed spaces where soil health, biodiversity and wildlife are encouraged, but which still look good to the human eye. I started with a list of questions for Joe, but the interview became more of a fireside chat. So pull up a chair and join Joe and I as we wend our way through eco gardening. Joe begins by talking about how her background influences her work. My grandfather, he was a royal science teacher and he came from a generation of um, land workers that were all pre-chemical and um, they were kind of, um, they, they all lived in the Devonshire countryside right on the edge of Exmoor and Dartmoor um, and they really were immersed in that whole craft of land management, you know, where you really do, you lay your hedges, you, <laughs> you, 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 um, you keep kill certain amounts of wild species to keep the levels right you look after your water courses you you, you know you um uh yeah it, um it, it's kind of permaculture before there was permaculture really i mean to some extent you know because you know you know that you're handing it on to the next generation and um yeah that, um and then my dad he was um a conservation engineer and he was really um he looked after sort of um uh what would you call them ecclesiastical buildings and rural buildings so he would advise on how to um restore them or um uh um repurpose them and he was really kind of interested in um how those buildings then spoke to the cultural landscape around them but also the 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 environment around them you know the, the 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 green landscape and i think that both of those men were quite big influences on my lives. I mean, my dad, he was a serial doer-upper of, of buildings, <laughs> um, and mostly rural buildings. And so my, my, my childhood was, sent, was spent on, on sites of, um, you know, where it was, everything was derelict and then everything came together again. Um, and I think you learn a lot by watching that. Um, mm. And experiencing that, um, he was also a really, really brilliant and talented kind of amateur gardener. Um, and so, yeah, you kind of, um, I, 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 I now look back and realise that I absorbed a lot without really knowing that I was absorbing it. I thought that was just a normal childhood, but it was actually not at all. You know, I'd be taken by my, my grandfather along the river X and he'd show me how you spot an otter and how you track otter tracks and how you know where they were going to be and things like that. And when, you know, much later on, I've realized that not that's kind of like a pretty unique craft (laughs) 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 that other people don't really um, get taught by their grandparents, you know? So, yeah, definitely. So I think that that's been, that was why I got called to landscape through that childhood, um, not not necessarily through go, f- through going to a garden and kind of going, oh wow, this is an amazing garden. I really want to do this. Um, it's just like I really wanted to re-experience that connection that I had in childhood. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think many children go otter tracking. I might have tracked the favourite in the 215 at Haydock because my great granddad yeah. used to take me down the betting shop and leave me outside while he went in and placed his bets, but <laughs> not quite so. Um, <laughs> so that, obviously you you said you're kind of late into the game relatively with your yeah. gardening. Um, so what is it that you actually do at the moment? What What types of projects do you work on? 
So um, it's, I kind of divide myself between doing some writing work, um, sometimes for magazines like Bloom um, uh, and, uh, and other places, and I'm trying to, trying to get more writing work. I do consultancy work, and that's mostly on planting, and um, I look at um, doing specs for people for meadow plantings or meadow seedings or pr how you would prep the area before you were then going to um so it or, or or what and what will you do or management systems for 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 doing um uh those kind of semi wild semi natural plantings um and then um i uh i also run th this garden um and i'm hoping that eventually i might be able to open this garden and run workshops from this garden mm. that's the long term aim um yeah, but uh, I think you might have still, a queue still, around the block when you first open your garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's still it's still a way off, but I'm, I'm sort of just beginning to 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 um, get there. I mean, it's it's um, it's very 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 new, and um, it looks still looks a bit new, you know. So it's uh, I'm I'm aware it's not quite quite at the at the stage yet where I want to um, expose it. <laughs> oh God, will it ever but, be um, though? I mean. Gardens well, so... no. I mean, yeah, perfectionist. The perfectionist mm. in me will never be happy. But um, uh, <laughs> I think it's yeah, it's um, it's beginning to get there. And um, uh, yeah, I sort of um, I, I yeah, but I think that for me, like the the garden speaks louder, really, than anything else about um, uh, you know what's possible and what I what I what I'd like to what, how I'd like to see garden design go, or how I'd like to see people think of, conceive gardens. So yeah, it's uh, and it's also the um, the place that I love and like the place that I belong to. You know, so mm. yeah, it's like it's it's the the grounding for me. So yeah. <laughs> it's difficult to leave it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, you haven't had that problem this year. You've been fine. <laughs> no, no, I've been so blessed being here. Yeah. Definitely this year. Um, definitely. So, what is it about your garden that makes it different? Because you have had quite a bit of coverage of it, and it is it yeah. is quite unusual. So, may, I um, think maybe I mean, briefly you can just sum it up. Yeah, it's um, so. <sighs> So, like I was saying, that that childhood of mine that I had, which was sort of um, um, my parents were serial doer uppers, and we sort of went from um, uh, derelict barn farmhouse or derelict barn to derelict farmhouse or derelict barn, and 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 and, and did them up. I I similarly, I think, like as soon as I saw this place, it was um, it's a derelict farm. But it's also a derelict um, canal industry um, and railway line. So uh, <laughs> um, we have a, the, there's a milking there was a milking farm here, but there was also um, another barn that was connected to um, the Somerset Coal Canal that used to run through the garden in the 18. 90s and um that has uh it also has a huge um 75 meter long um uh tunnel canal tunnel that this is in in the garden um and um so when we arrived there were all these kind of like um it was d completely derelict had been derelict for many many years so it was bramble everywhere um and then you've um and budlia um kind of the classic budlia and bramble site and then you have this kind of enormous railway line running through bisecting the site as well um which um, ran until the 1960s so quite late 1960s so um you've got all this kind of like yeah just it's a classic brownfield site classic post-industrial site um right in the middle of a very rural place so it's kind of really there's loads of juxtaposition going on and loads of um interesting historical features and uh yeah um i i have always been interested in wildflowers and wildflower plantings and um i knew immediately as soon as i saw the sites it was going to be because it was there was just crushed concrete everywhere you looked or ballast um absolutely have been all the topsoil have been taken off it by the farmers previous farmers and put down on the paddocks down below where where and the pastures down below where the where the 
cows would have fed. And so it had been stripped bare and um, um, it was going to be, it, it was, it's on a very steep slope facing directly south. Um, so it's perfect for growing things that mostly most other people would um, struggle to grow, you know, um, wildflowers and, um, you know, um, things that really love a, a strong alkaline pH, which tend to be the things I like. <laughs> mm. it's, I was so, it's so interesting to think about how maybe, a, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, yes. for some people still now that their dream is like oh, a yeah, patch now, of kind definitely. of, l- l- what, yeah. their dream is a patch of loamy soil. It's like, oh, you yeah. know, I've got to have this beautiful yeah. crumbly loam. And then you saw this site and just went, oh, wahoo. It's just full of like, you know, uh, like you say, ballast and, and, and it's really to some people I'm promising, but to you, it's an absolute dream. And I think probably moving forward, that will become something where people will look at it and see the opportunity and go, actually, this is fantastic. So much so, so much so. I mean, I mean, I mean, personally, I think that this is the future for garden design. First of all, we are finding out that um, more triple S sites are brownfield sites than they are greenfield sites because, you know, the nitrogen deposition is so bad on all these um, green sites that, um, you know, you can't get the diversity of plants on them. So, you know, you need, you need these very, very nutrient poor sites and these, you know, like John Little does with his, his A13 garden, you need these kind of like very compromised sites to grow um, really these be- beautiful rural plants that um, um, our insects and our invertebrate species are really dependent on. And, you know, and then we've got all these birds that are massively in decline and they're dependent on the invertebrates. Um, so you, you've, and also these sites, um, because they've been so disturbed, you've got subsoil in one bit. So I've got this kind of really interesting site where I've got, um, uh, like clayed but down the bottom from where the canal used to run and that's really claggy and kind of it was anaerobic soil when we first moved here and it was it's really damp and soggy and then right at the top I've got this very very dry um, ballast ridden you know gravel underneath that and underneath that limestone rock <laughs> so I've got these kind of this enormous diversity in that mosaic of habitats but also mosaic of what I can plant as well so you know I can have this like I can have boggy bits down there and I can have um, woodland bits here and I can have um, you know meadow there and and then very dry grab Beth Chateau style drought planting at the top. It's, mm. it's sort of, it's perfect for, for, um, for gardening really, because the, 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 what you, you know, and specifically gardening, not, not kind of like um, turning it back into a farm or anything like that, because, you know, you can, you can create so many different, um, places with, within it so you can have the it's like a jewel box <laughs> you, can, you can you can go here and you can see the, see that bit and you can go there and and have something a completely different experience altogether um yeah and the, you know as our as the environmental crisis rolls out and we all know it's coming and we all know global warming is coming and we all know that it's going to have huge effects on our food security and our food production i think Increasingly, we're going to see fertile soils or fertile places having to move to edible production or production of some sort of edibles, whether it be that, um, yeah, uh, that's how people are going to want to use that land. So we're going to need to um, adapt ornamental gardens to fit these sites that are left behind. Um, and then mm. they need to also function in a different way as well. So they, they, I mean, they need to not just function as kind of like something that get, we go, oh, that's really aesthetically beautiful. They need to have ecological function in them as well. So, you know, um, I'm quite conscious that the next thing that I want to work on on this site is I've noticed that there are quite a lot of plants in the meadow that do really, really well. And then I've noticed that some of them have phytoremediation qualities, um, qualities that um, mop up pollution. Um, and that is one of the, the big areas that we're, we, as garden designers, I can see that being a really excellent 
tool in our in our armory if you can if you you know it, a place where, where we we could go and we could add that extra function into what we're offering um you know we're not just offering something beautiful we're offering something that will clean up the soil mm. um i mean the interesting thing about that is that just as we're kind of realizing the importance of brownfield sites i think the government is probably helping <laughs> on redeveloping every last one of them so yes. um yeah. Yes. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so we we kind of we've had a chat before about rewilding, um, and yes. obviously it has been a buzzword for a while now, and it, and it's creeping into gardens. Um, and I just yes. wondered whether you thought we could rewild our gardens. Is that something we should be kind of aiming to do? Yes. Uh, it's a tricky one. Um, I think I, I went to the rewilding symposium, which was some years ago now um um and when it was sort of first becoming a word that everybody was using and since then it's almost gone become ubiquitous as a word and um you know i follow it as a hashtag on instagram <laughs> and some really interesting stuff pops up and think that's rewilding <laughs> rewilding right, my beard thinks that's really, yes <laughs> and a, a lot of it is about rewilding people's minds and bodies um it seems to me and it seems to have been sort of um yeah so um i it's um you know, and one person's re- rewilding is another person's let it go to rack and ruin. And um, I think rather unhelpfully, um, it, within horticulture, it's become associated, or within agriculture, it's become associated with land abandonment and this kind of rather strange notion of ungardening or letting things be and not, not intervening at all. Um, and... I th- we all know that if we do abandon land completely, like, uh, you know, when I came to this land and it had been abandoned, um, we, it, it, it just, it, it, if left to its own devices, natural succession occurs and, it, you know, it goes back to um, pretty dense woodland, which is not hugely biodiverse. Um, and, you know, when you look at rewilding Britain or look at rewilding Europe and, they, they're talking about large-scale re- restoration of ecosystems using herbivores and using um, wolves to move those herbivores around the landscape and using trophic cascades so that they you create different habitats. And you're not going to get that in a one-acre garden. You're not going to manage to do that. And um, I'm not sure how useful it is in terms of um, so, I mean, th- th- the short answer is no, I don't think we can rewild our gardens. But I do think that this kind of, these ideas that rewilding has given us, these ideas that you can re- reinstate natural processes and you can restore biodiversity, I think they're useful goals to then assimilate into your garden design as goals, as long-term goals of the, of the, of the site, of, of the landscape or into your gardening and your management. Mm. And um, I think in that sense, it is it is a useful con- concept. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 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 I mean, it's cultivated space. So, you know, in its pure form, it can't be rewilded. Um, but it can do something that rewilding space can't do. It can connect you in an intimate way with a wider web of life and that's where the true value of the garden comes into its own you know um you can you can um interact with it on a daily basis rather than um uh walk through a nature reserve as it were and 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 there's the 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 other point which is that uh, rewild is not a panacea um we still need other types of landscape too. You know, um, our, our, we've had, I think it was like a 97% decline in our um, flower-rich meadows since World War Two, which is just shocking. And meadows and meadows, um, meadow style um, plantings, they have the most plant species per meter squared and so they're necessarily going to support the most invertebrates per meter squared and they need regular human man you know um interference um and um, management um so i think 
that's where we need to look we can we can we can't recreate a rewilded space in a very in a in a one acre garden you know we're not going to save um a lynx or a beaver <laughs> in our gardens but we, we we can save the ragged robin plant for example and we can um, make sure that we boost moth populations as much as possible um that that's that's those are achievable goals Hmm. Um, I think where rewilding becomes a problem, in, in my opinion, is maybe when it gets applied to naturalistic. That's when people say naturalistic and and they use rewilding as as yeah. the kind of catch-all term. That that for me is slightly worrying because it's it's saying that rewilding is an aesthetic uh, when you know that wasn't really what it was intended to be. And no, so not at all. Then it becomes you yeah. know kind of a bit of a pastiche of of what rewilding is about um and i find that a little bit well, it's a bit dangerous sometimes really yeah exactly it's 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 become misappropriated hasn't it and so, as a term and so it almost means whatever anybody wants to make it mean um and so um and it's it's a bit like meadows i think the same thing with the word meadows a lot of people use the word meadow um, when they're um, talking about um, the Hitchmo Dunnett style, you know, s- s- planting, you know, of, of annuals or whatever. And uh, they're not meadows, you know. That's not a he- that's not a, you know a meadow is a hay meadow, and it's that's a d- distinct thing um, and a distinct set of plants um and a distinct eco- ecology and a distinct management system you're not not plowing it up every year um uh so you know a, a, and and again i think that you know plant life are right they're sort of saying that people are getting confused now between um native species like the californian poppy to california and our own indigenous species they they they, they don't know what is a meadow plant and what's it that's indigenous to this country and what's a meadow plant that's indigenous to others and they they now um the aesthetic of the meadow is now confused with with the um what the actual meadow is mm. and what it's meant to be doing um and i think we've got, got to be careful haven't we in horticulture because this is what we seem to be doing is um taking taking words that are applied to conservation and um, applied to uh, uh, con- uh, um, e- e- ecologies, very distinct ecologies, and then we're sort of appropriating them into our own um, design world, but we're not we're not taking the functionality, we're just taking the aesthetic or we're just taking the, the idea um, the overall idea, but not actually the 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 the, the long term goals, and um, that's where it starts to get really confusing for for for, for lots of people, including myself. I, I find myself in you know quite confused about um, whether what I grow is a meadow or not a meadow, or you know what is meadow, or what's long grass, what's you know, um, and 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 then when you're talking to clients or other people and say, you know, um, you can be talking completely across purposes about what they want (laughs) when they're saying, I want a meadow here, you know, what does that mean? (laughs) It's uh, it's really, yeah, it would be good if we, um, if we could be much more ecologically specific about what we're talking about and not then misappropriate the terms to other to other 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 seedings give them just something something different you know yeah yeah that's true Uh, and or if you do want to use those terms certainly educate yourself about what they mean i guess yes um yeah as to sort of changing tax slightly although it it probably does tie into the whole idea of gardening um and the way it's developing and changing and and what it means to people um again we kind of had a conversation a while back about um younger people coming into horticulture and how you perceived that what they were doing was was very different to maybe the kind of 
traditional gardener as we see them um, and, and as we are. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk a bit about how you see maybe a kind of offshoot of the younger generation gardening today and what it means to them and kind of if it differs to traditional horticulture. Mm, yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I, I came to horticulture as a second career um, and um, so I already um, already had quite distinct ideas about what I thought was good and bad practice before I came to it um, and I can see that um, um, I'm, uh, when I work, when, I, when, I, when I'm working, um, the young people that are coming into it, um, the ones that, um, for example, the, the gardeners that I use here, the ones that uh, do the best job and the ones that stick around tend to come from um, a regenerative agriculture or permaculture background. And they don't tend to have gone to a conventional um, RHS course or um, MVQ um, uh, schooling and um, they seem to be more open to um, to uh, this this kind of low intervention uh, but more skilled gardening that that, that um, these these kind of naturalistic or wild gardens need they you know they don't they don't need somebody who is a maintenance well we, we want to stop we want to stop spraying the chemicals but we also don't want to stop just mowing and blowing mm -hmm. everything and that's how we maintain manage it you know we want to move away from maintenance to management and that means in re-embracing this kind of notion that that, that gardening is a craft um, and a skill set that um, can be honed and um, and uh, and um, you can you can work your way up to expert gardener um, <laughs> and you can you can uh, do this in tune with the ecological systems around them and you know that's it's also based on um, this idea that you know there's something deeper going on within the garden than just a pure aesthetic look that that it's ba that, that the garden's about um an expression of a lifestyle that you want to live and a, and a philosophy that you want to you want to uh, adhere to um and yeah i um it's a shame really because i think um you know, permaculture itself is kind of slightly outside horticulture, and then the two things don't really mix. And um, I think we're uh, we're in danger unless we start to, you know, um, broaden the spectrum of what what a garden's functionality is and what a garden is for. Unless we start, we're, we're going to lose lose interest from that younger generation who really want to a garden to not just look good but they want it to do good it needs to be authentic it needs to um uh have a backstory it needs to be really real you know it needs to be real it needs to be genuine and they're not interested in um, you know, you can see that in their in the way that they've turned off high street fashion, and, and in the way that they've um, you know they've turned off um, uh, in their food, their what how they're interested in food production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're, they're interested in in asking the question, you know, how do I do this better? Um, how do I do this well? Mm. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's interesting. When you were talking, I thought um, about things like the RHS training and, you know, various schemes that we've got. Um, and maybe something we need to look at in the future for gardening is actually not being afraid to specialise in something because we tend to try and be generalists and know every, a little bit about everything. When actually sometimes, especially the way that you're gardening and the way that you're, you're seeing gardens, is even to be a specialist in a particular region would be useful. And there would be no problem with that. You could certainly say, OK, well, I'm going to specialise in, you know, water, waterways or, or, or kind of water 
features for want of a better word in the garden and that's going to be my area of speciality and that's that's fine maybe we do need to focus down more yeah i agree i i think that um you know we've got this um we've got we 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 now need to look at the garden as a space in which we can not just um because i think that this is written about quite a lot at the moment not just sort of um develop a, an, an intimate relationship ourselves with with nature so that it's sort of good for our mental health and physical well-being but we now need to see the garden as a place that can function in different ways which can um help us lead Lead, lead, we'd be leading edge in the ch in a change of lifestyle that that we all know we now need to achieve. We know we know that we're living from nature in economies and systems that don't value it whatsoever, and that that is causing um, mass mass extinctions, and it's causing global warming. And we ha now need to reconfigure those systems and that means reconfiguring our lifestyles and reconfiguring the way that we we live in, in in interaction and you know the garden can be kind of like that domestic space where you can reevaluate that relationship and um try try new ways of making sure that you're you're in harmony and in balance with it um rather than dominating it um and um yeah it's it's a, it's it that means that it's not just a place where it looks beautiful and you just sit and go isn't that beautiful and isn't that rose beautiful and um uh, it's it's a place that where you, you know the water comes off your roof and um fills a pond <laughs> it's a place where you know your wastewater gets uh, biofiltrated or through a, a beautiful wet wet drainage system it, it's a it's a place where i don't know we, we but we need to now be open to inventing ways and being um much more creative in our garden spaces about um making them spaces which can um realize a new way of living in in, in i mean so for example i um it's kind of like slightly left field but um uh this is kind of the area that i'm really really interested in because i now think that gardens can be really really creative spaces for us to kind of s find solutions to a new way of living that's much more um in tune with with natural processes and the other day i was um I've, I've been searching and searching for various different things on the internet. I came, I came across something that was called a fog harp, which is um, um, a basically a, um, uh, lots of fine, fine lines, uh, fine, fine wires um, suspended on this um, in system. And what it does is it harvested the harvests the ambient water within fog in dry regions. Wow. Uh, and 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 it it drips down the wire and then it 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 can fill it can fill you know it can fill uh, ponds or dew ponds or um, it can it can it, it go into an irrigation system. They use it a lot in Chile apparently, and they're thinking now of using it in California. For, um, and um, uh, the 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 system itself actually came from. Um, a, a guy staring for a long time at um, the redwoods in um, in its local park and seeing that the redwood needles that that's what they did they they captured the ambient water and it then dropped to the the, the root zone um, and they were sort of effectively watering themselves um, in quite a dry region. And he, so, he, so he came up with this biometric kind of d design based on that. And the, the, looking at it is at the moment, it looks really, really rather pants, this thing. You know, it's sort of like just a, a sort of frame with a load of wires. But you can see that sculpturally, it, it has potential. You know, somebody if, if a sculptor got hold of it or some sort of artist got hold of it, you could come up with something rather beautiful. Um, and that could sit in somebody's garden you know and it could harvest water in a dry region 
and you'd have water. <laughs> um, it, it, and you'd kind of think, yeah, this is what, what, how we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking completely outside the box now, not kind of like looking um, for um, yet another way of doing a patio or something. We need to be thinking about these ways in which we, we, we know lots of changes coming. How can we adapt what we do outside and how can we engineer new ways of 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 living in this in this in this envir- environment in a more balanced way so we use less and we we give back more but yeah it's, that's a rather extreme example but um you know, nevertheless that it was it kind of like it it was quite interesting to see us kind of like whoa yeah four car yeah. never heard such things yeah four car yeah <laughs> brilliant um, <laughs> no. So, well, I think, to be honest with you, we kind of answered the final question in that one, which was, what's the future of horticulture? So um, is there anything kind of else that you wanted to add? Because, to be honest, I think we kind of skipped through everything at a lovely pace and covered most things, even though I didn't really ask you the questions that I sent you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, so for, for me, um, yeah, I don't know about horticulture, but I definitely, in, like... Um, in the area of design and landscaping, I think we need to scrap this idea that gardens are some sort of, I don't know, extension of the house, um, an extension of some domestic space. Uh, we need to like incorporate these two urgent needs of sustainability and ecological function in the way that we conceive them. But that doesn't mean to say that you kind of completely lose the aesthetics Um you've just got they've just got to work harder um um and i think that you know if you borrow from other disciplines like ecology technology engineering you know um various different sciences soil science in particular as well you know because that's there's huge amounts of going on there then we can start creating gardens with quite serious long-term scope and vision rather, rather than just something with a has just a purely human human and aesthetic function and, and that and that's it um and uh, yeah the, the future's the future is quite exciting i think because there's 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 so much open now to you know we, we're at a time where they say necessity is the mother of all invention and i think we are going to necessarily have to really really concentrate quite hard on how do we up the functionality of our gardens over and above you know just being beautiful places to live live in and um that that means that you know we might we might be entering a really really exciting time a really creative time that's what i hope anyway i really really hope that i really hope that because and (laughs) <laughs> it's very easy with all this eco anxiety isn't it to lose your hope and to lose your to sort of think well oh, i just give up you know it's just it, legislation isn't changing nothing's changing you know, everybody's got their heads in the sand you know um yeah uh, the, there are lots of people in this world and you know I, I, what i do is just a tiny drop in an ocean um and if, if gardens can become places of hope and places um, which don't just um, don't just mitigate against all the various different things or, um, and aren't just resilient, but they actually regenerate and they restore stuff, then you know it gives us the mental mental capabilities to carry on going, and I think that's really really important. <laughs> really important for all of us as humankind you know it's really important now to find things to pin hope onto we recorded this episode towards the end of last year but joe's final advice seems more fitting now than ever thanks very much joe for sharing your wisdom and interesting perspective on the world of horticulture and thanks to you too for listening i hope you enjoyed listening as much as i enjoyed talking to joe There is a little bit more from the interview that came in at the end of our chat. It's a bit off topic from the main interview, but it's still interesting. So for the Patreon listeners, you'll find that's available on the Patreon page as a download. 
So once again, thank you to the London College of Garden Design Melbourne, who sponsored this episode. Check them out at lcgd.com.au. And I leave you with Dr Ian Bedford, talking about winter moths. Travelling down a country lane on a cold winter's night, you may be surprised to see in the glare of your lights a moth flying along a frost-encrusted hedgerow. This might seem unusual, since this time of year, creatures from the bug world should be in the dormant stage of their lives, hidden away from the bleak and often savage winter weather. And particularly since Lepidopterans are assumed to be highly susceptible to sub-zero temperatures. So what are these moths doing, flying around and apparently risking their lives? Well, amongst the 2,500 moth species in Britain, there's a couple that have evolved to use the frigid season of dormancy to quietly get on with their lives. Unsurprisingly, these are called the winter moths. From November through to late February, winter moths emerge from the ground, where they patiently waited as pupae since early June. Using a process called endothermy, they generate heat within their bodies, which protects them from the fatal effects of freezing and allows them to remain active. The new males unfold their light brown wings and take to the air, whilst the flightless females climb up the trunks of nearby trees, where they release chemical signals to attract the males into mate. Once mated, the males soon die, whilst the females begin laying their eggs into nooks and crannies on the bark. When completed, the females then tumble to the ground and also die. During March, before the frosts have ended, but when the leaf buds on many trees begin to break open, tiny caterpillars begin hatching from the eggs within the bark. Blown by the wind, they're dispersed and begin feeding on the emerging leaves of many different tree species. As they grow, they become one of the most important food sources for the blue tits, who have evolved to coincide their first brood with the presence of the winter moth caterpillars collecting around a hundred every day for each of their chicks. So, for sustaining the essential food webs within our ecosystems, these humble little moths, with their unique ability to remain active during the harshest of winters, have a very important role to play. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.